Good morning. I've got the gamble back there. No, you don't. No, I you keep yes, saying I that. Do. I don't I think it's really bad. I'll there. produce it after the break. All right. So, all right. Um, call this meeting to order. We have a little bit of an agenda change this morning. So after we do the Pledge of Allegiance and public comment number one, the first item on our agenda is actually going to be a discussion about co closing the uh, county early today and uh, having uh, tomorrow being closed also. And then there'll be a short break while we kind of coordinate a media release in part. And then we'll come back and we'll start on the rest of the agenda. So would all who are care to please uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public comment. And would anyone care to come up and address the board on anything uh, or anything on today's agenda? No one. We're going to move now to this added item. So, if uh, Deb, if you'd like to stay right there, and Alyssa, come on up, and we'll discuss uh, the possibility of closing the county early today and having it stay closed tomorrow due to the uh, severe cold that is being predicted. Loris, while they're coming up, would you mind? announcing what your decision was on tonight's meeting, regardless oh, of how this conversation Yes, we will be canceling tonight's uh, Master Matrix. And uh, Leanne's ready to go, uh, with a, or almost ready to go with press release and get it out there to everyone. And no, no time to reschedule at this point? No, no time to reschedule at this point. Um, I will make note that, you know, this is twice that uh, the staff in the City of Nevada and the City of Nevada Police Department have worked very uh, well together to identify two evening meetings at an off-site location. Um, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that a third time or that we even are going to make an effort to do that a third time. But that'll be a separate uh, discussion uh, with I'll have the staff and some other entities afterwards for that. So now I see everybody situated. Good morning, and could you two help us walk through the process should we decide to close today early at one o'clock? Sure, good morning. Um, I'm just gonna uh, read out of our, our infinite letter policy. Um, it says, in extreme circumstances, it may be necessary to close the administration building or other county offices and facilities or have a late start. If an employee's office is officially closed by the Board of Supervisors, then regular employees will be paid for hours lost due to the closing of the office. If there is a decision for a late start, full-time employees will be paid for hours between a regularly scheduled start time and a delayed start time. So just a little clarification on this. It has happened very rarely. Um, and, and, and how, it, how it is implemented is employees are paid for their lost hours. So they're scheduled for eight hours a day. Um, if you close and they're unable to finish their eight hour shift, the county has paid for the remainder of their shift, of those eight hours. Um, if an employee um, had called in sick or was on vacation leave that week, it would still be considered sick or vacation because it wasn't the closing that kept them from finishing their shift that day. That's how it's been handled in the past. That's how our policy is is written. What? How does it work um, with different elected officials? Do they each make that decision to close their office, um, or let staff go early, or is that rest with the board of supervisors? The board officially closes the buildings, and that's what triggers this policy. Um, as far as letting staff go early, use vacation, that that is between. The, the individual and their supervisor within the office. That's also part of this policy. If the employee, you know, if the, if the roads are bad and they work it out with their supervisor, it does say they can take a day of vacation um, if they don't feel safe. We don't, we don't want employees traveling when they don't feel like they can travel. They, they use their own judgment when the offices are open in regards to that. Um, I don't recall that we've had 
um, an elected official who is their office and has triggered this policy. It's always been when the Board of Supervisors closes the buildings, makes that determination, then that's when the employees are paid for their lost hours. So yeah. I believe, uh, so I've been here eight years now, and I think in the time I've been here, we've had one early closure <laughs> and one late start. I don't think we've ever closed for a full day. I, at least I can't remember it if we have. I think that what we're dealing with here, or potentially dealing with here, is a whole different level. I think the fact that, that we see um, Iowa State now closing for two and a half days, uh, they won't reopen again until noon Thursday. Uh, I don't remember ever seeing that before. Um, uh, I think it, it's worth our time to, to talk this through. The thing I want to point out is there's no real budgetary implications to making a decision like this. There is productivity implications, right? We lose some productivity from our employees, uh, but in essence, we just continue to pay as if we were open, which is what we budgeted for. We just use, lose the productivity of that time. One other item to uh, just point out here, there will be individuals that will have to work. We have 24 seven operations. They do have to work regardless if the actual offices are closed. Um, there's no additional compensation they get paid for their their shift. I mean, if they work overtime, that's that's separate from here. But it's there's no additional compensation above and beyond. It's what if they're not able to work the full shift, like if it's the facilities department and they're here half a day, then then they would be compensated for the remainder of that eight-hour shift. Okay. So if we were looking at 1 p.m. today and till 8 a.m. on Thursday morning. Um, for what would that mean for uh, facilities and uh, as opposed to secondary rows and first responders, our, our jail and deputy departments? Because I'm thinking about facilities, would a second shift be called in on Wednesday then? Or would it still be scheduled? In the past, they haven't called them in. Um, we do have a new director. Um, I, I, the, the points where facilities have still been it had to come in is to clear the lots. I mean, there's, there's still some, that type of maintenance, um, but if the buildings are closed, if, if the buildings are closed, if there's something that um, you know has to be done, then those employees don't have to report to work. Okay. And then for um, uh, the jail, for the sheriff, under even under the sheriff. Um, how is that handled? And then for secondary roads, is it on a call-in basis if there's no snow or yeah? Yeah, I spoke with Darren Moon, the county engineer, this morning, and he said that um, the northeast part of the county roads up there, there are still some passable roads because of the wind and the snow that's drifting across. It seems to be a little bit worse up there than it is for the other parts of the county. Um, and so, but tomorrow with the winds dying down, it gives secondary roads crews an option or an opportunity to make some headway on getting things cleared out. Right now, if they clear out a road, it's blowing closed again. So, sure. they, so he, I, he, it would be his call as far as uh, bringing those crews out. He did also say that um, it's, it's helpful that he has an office staff person, um, whoever that may be, in the office to take any calls that were coming in on, uh, on days like today or when there's been inclement weather. So again, I think that would be his call as to whether or not somebody would need to come in to, to manage the phones. Since the buildings, we would be doing the closure of the buildings for exempt employees and elected officials who might want to come in tomorrow. What is the policy on that? Should we plan on not having that option? Uh, based on whether facilities comes in to clear out uh, the, the parking lot and, and, and all the buildings, um, or does that cause problems if some, as I say, exempt employees who opt on their own or elected officials opt to come in? You know, just like if it were a Saturday or something. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. So, so let me. If you don't mind, I'm going to make a recommendation for you guys to, to chew over and then we can see where we get. My recommendation is that we close uh, to the public as of 1 p.m. today and we stay closed all day. Wednesday we open for normal uh, 
business on Thursday morning. Um, and that part of that closure to the public is that we give each one of our department heads and, of course, our elected officials the ability to determine what they need from their staff, but all of our buildings will be closed to the public beginning at 1 p.m. today and running all day tomorrow. Okay. Could I just um, yes. do some information here? Um, Keith Morgan was planning on holding a jurisdictional workshop tomorrow evening and has not called it off and it would be in this building. Um, well, if we're closed, so well, to me that so would that would mean that he could not hold it here. If we did that, correct? Oh, and yeah, I'm it. sure. Yeah. Just just for information because I was going to be attending it and I saw his uh, email, so I that's why I asked. After um, we take the vote here, we will be taking about a, a, a either that or after the discussion of, of item agenda number four, we'll be taking a small break so that Alyssa and Deb and Leanne Harder um, Outreach can coordinate about sending out an appropriate press release. I think Leanne's got a, a shell started and um, uh, I can take a look at it. And uh, so then it might be a good time to contact Keith Morgan and just let him know if someone could do that, looking out at either staff or, you know, if you could thank staff for offering to do that. So at least we know if he's, uh, if we need to add that to the press release. Because okay. uh, if he's having that workshop, who's he having in? Uh, there's only about five people, and I'm sure he'd be willing to contact them. He just needs to know. All right, got it. So if you guys take care. All right. So is there uh, any uh, input from anyone else? Any further, further thoughts? The question was asked about the sheriff's office. Yes, they are as normal for deputies in the jail. It's 24/7. Okay, that's not ability. My question would be the clerk of court. Okay. <laughs> the state offices. Yeah, the, the whole court system. DHS over names. Okay. So by by what Rick said as far as the elected official determining, I mean I would imagine there's court um Wednesday tomorrow unless they cancel I haven't. I that, so so that? I believe that the Board of Supervisors, if the Board of Supervisors so chooses, has the ability to close any of our buildings, mm -hmm. including the court, uh, to the public. I don't know how the court will feel about that, but I don't know that that's necessarily part of our conversation right now. Our, our conversation, as I see it, is if, if the three of us deem that there is enough of a safety concern, that the conditions warrant closure, then we make that decision to close, and everybody who deals with the public in one of our buildings is going to have to accommodate that decision. Um, okay. Uh, go ahead. I didn't know if you wanted to speak to um, I think I'm ready to make a motion. All right. Um, I would move that we close all county buildings to the public from 1 p.m. Tuesday today to 8 a.m. this Thursday, um, with the exception of 24 7 operations <clears throat> and essential operations. Yeah, I'll second. I, I need clarification on the last part of your motion. So, so our essential operations and our uh, first responders, that's not, I mean, they deal with the public, but all, all I think we're talking about doing is saying our doors are closed to members of the public and everything else that happens beyond that, including facilities, movement, snow in the parking lot, if Joe B. so deems that that's needed, uh, Darren Moon working with his secondary roads, as I view it, we're giving the motion that I would like us to get to is we're closing to the public and everything else that happens around that is at the discretion of our department heads and elected officials. But we're not open to members of the public coming into any of our buildings. Okay. You open to an amendment on that? I right. amend my motion. Yeah, I, and I didn't know that Just I needed you. Yeah. It doesn't, in terms of direction about employees, it doesn't you're saying that needs to be another motion or we don't need a motion on that. 
So for, for clarity and cleanness, I would like it if we got to a motion that was the first part of your motion, Linda. It was we close as of one to the public as of 1 p.m. today, and we reopen at 8 a.m. Thursday, and we just leave everything else alone. Okay, and then that's part of the motion part of it, yep. right? And, and I'll second her amendment. So, Shelly, that gets us down just to the first part of our motion. Right. Okay. All right. There's no further discussion on the motion. Merkin? Aye. Sanders? Aye. Olson? Aye. Now, follow up then internally um, with directions to, now I'm going to think it's Alyssa and Deb as internal di uh, um, director of operations, external director of operations, for you two to communicate outward with the affected staff and other elected officials. Is that correct? Having never done this before, all right. Right. There typically is a email that comes out from the board chair, but the board chair or the board would like to direct us to send an email out that is fine. I mean, it's however the board would you like to. You want to craft email. it, and then I think I'll send it, I guess, or, or look it over first. Yeah. So if I could make a suggestion, I would hope that start immediately. We would ask uh, Leanne to draft a release and Alyssa to draft an email. And once those two things are done, then I would suggest we take a five minute recess for you to review those and get them out. Right, okay, so uh, I believe Leanne has started on that uh, re the release to the public. And Alyssa, have you started already on something that would go out? Okay, super. And then you guys let me know and we'll take the break. All right, thank you. A little difference in the morning. All right, so we're going to go on now. Hi, Shelly. Hi. <laughs> okay. To um, item number four on the agenda, which is discussion and consideration of funding uh, of funding requests from community and family services, and that's for the Iowa Department of Public Health Substance Abuse Prevention Services slash Supplies in Story County. So, Shelly, come on, come on up and introduce yourself, please, and let us know what you'd like. Hi, Shelly. Supervisor at Community and Family Resources. Can you pull the microphone closer? Oh, sure. Should I bring it down a little bit? Thanks. Um, I'm Shelly Zabel. I'm a Provincial Supervisor at Community and Family Resources. And last fall, Iowa Department of Public Health put out a request for proposal for uh, substance abuse prevention and treatment services. And our agency applied. Uh, we were selected. Um, as the provider for uh, both treatment and prevention services for uh, Boone and Story County. Um, not a lot of differences except for the addition of prevention. Um, we are requesting um, $7,200 to assist with uh, things such as evidence-based curriculum, evidence-based curriculum training. Um, sometimes there are services that we aren't uh, able to provide under the Iowa Integrated, excuse me, Integrated Network Provider um, funding, things like um, if we had a group of youth that were doing a service project. We're able to help them plan a project, but we're not able to be there that day um, under these funds. Just one of the rules that they have. Um, if there's a child that's already seeking or in treatment services, um, then prevention is not allowed to provide youth development kinds of experiences and all kids need with development experiences. Um, I put on your sheet the uh, strategic prevention framework, which we'll be using to address needs in Story County. Um, it's an 18 month contract initially with the, with the Iowa Department of Public Health. And in that first six months, we'll be providing the evidence-based uh, things. And then in that second six month, or second part of the contract, the full year, We'll be doing needs assessments so that we're able to know what the needs are in Story County and provide relevant services. Um, Shelly, are you asking um, for a similar type of sum from each of the other counties? We are. All right. We are. Yes. We know that um, 
we typically don't have enough dollars in each of our counties to fulfill a whole year of services. And this new RFP is very, very much focused on evidence-based, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. It's great stuff, but it's expensive, so. Um, I'll declare at this point, I, I sit on the CFR board, so um, I, I benefit in no way directly from this. I believe it would be legal for me to vote. I just oh, want absolutely. to make known up front okay, that I've been sitting on the board for a while. Yeah, the number of times we vote on things where we also serve on a board that touches them, we, we can't get into. We never have a vote. Absolutely. So, uh, so if, if I could start, I, I so appreciate, well, first of all, congratulations on getting the grant. Thank you. Uh, and I so appreciate the request here. Uh, so just by way of history, uh, of course, for you and Linda, the way Story County has typically dealt with a request like this, uh, even an outstanding request, has been to refer it to the asset administrative team just to have them filter through the other kinds of human services components that we have that might touch something like this. Um, I, I can think of two or three different occasions where we've had a request like this, even from somebody who's outside the asset process, as CFR is, that we've asked for our asset administrative team to take a look at it, ask whatever questions they have, get those answered, and then it come back to us as a board to make a, a funding decision. Um, so that's what I'm suggesting we do. I don't know that two weeks would be enough time, but I think two weeks, I'm looking at Deb Schilderoff, who's on that asset administrative team, uh, two weeks would be enough time to take a look at this and make a recommendation. I'd like us to be consistent with what we've done in the past in considering something like this. Um, I can certainly pass information on to the asset administrative team. Um, I believe we are meeting actually next week. However, um, the, the issue is, is we would, uh, if CFR wants to be brought into the asset process, um, that application, there's a letter of intent that's due right now, um, I believe by the 1st of June. No. So I'm let me stop. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that CFR go through the asset process. I'm just suggesting that, so I, and the most recent one I recall is I think Amos had a request one time that was not part of the asset process. It wasn't moving into the asset process but we still ran it through the administrative team just to look at it holistically with everything else we're doing in Story County and how it fits together. This seems to me, especially when we're talking about development opportunities for youth and things like that, it seems to me like it's gonna to touch a lot of different things that we're already doing in asset. And I just know for me, I wanna understand how it impacts everything as we make any kind of of extra outside the asset process funding decision. And it's interesting because at the uh, joint funders meeting, I I looked at it from the opposite end and asked very specifically, there was some money for YSS in there for what appeared to be the same. And so asked the staff uh, asset admin team, are we sure that this doesn't duplicate what in fact the grant now that CFR has gotten since that is from public health. So I understand what you're saying about the ask. So what you're really asking is just for the asset team to take one more look to make sure we don't have duplications of services. Is that it between what's funded through that we've already put money in for asset? So, and so yes, but it, I think what I'm asking for is a little bigger than that in that what I'm simply asking for is that we take this proposal and we refer it to our asset administrative team for comment and advice. Let them take a look at it, including what you mentioned, but even bigger and broader than that, and come back. These are our experts, right, who deal with this, the way human services touches everybody in Story County every day. Uh, that we just give them an opportunity. Maybe they won't have any comments, but they might, and I would hate for us to take some kind of action before we at least give them the opportunity to ask their questions, if there are questions, and then make some kind of comments, I would think, through Deb, back to us. And Shelly, just I, to kind of help you a little bit, um, and because of course CFR used to be with the asset process, um, is that we function in our social services so differently than the other seven counties that are covered by this grant that CFR has, that I'm sure their board of supervisors just went ahead and approved it, right? Because that it, it's all one, 
going seamless through the Board of Supervisors. What, what Supervisor Sanders is just asking is that the team that ordinarily would deal with all of this um, and dealt with when YSS had this portion of the grant, right, before, uh, just to explain to people, the Iowa Department of Public Health rearranged the grant um, who, and made it more comprehensive rather than splitting it up to agencies providing in smaller uh, catchment areas. And so it, it, it was either going to go to YSS or CFR. Um, it wasn't, it was no longer where they could subcontract back and forth necessarily. And if I might comment on Mrs. Walters, um, would there, and, I, and as Marissa said, you know, uh, Story County does have a more complex process because we run, you know, try to run all the human services um, funding through asset. If this were a grant, and I don't know, that would, um, you know, be applied for in the future, would you then be willing to look at running it? through the asset process so we wouldn't be doing something that was not going through our normal process. And Shelly, I'm going to speak. The relationship between asset and CFR is not good. So I think the board, would, the uh, CFR board, would need to make that decision. Well, and just a comment on that. Um, a few members of the asset administrative team met with CFR about three years ago just to touch base to see if there was anything needed in the community that um, CFR was providing and might need to come back to the funders for. And it was um, uh, decided that one time by CFR that everything they were providing within the Story County community for the citizens of Story County was being handled through either Medicaid, private insurance, or another grant that they were getting um, through DPH. And so I do think ACID has made a good faith effort in reaching out to CFR and just saying, hey, do you, are you doing something that we might need to, to consider funding locally again? Um, so I, I think that door, I think that door is, is open. Um, but yes, I mean, CFR would have to be willing to, to step across the threshold and, and go through the asset process again if they wanted local funding for some other things. Right, and this grant only was awarded, what was it? But I, I, I just speak as a board member. I suspect the board will have a, a conversation about whether they want to get involved with asset. And I'm hoping for this to the asset administrative team for comment and advice. Sorry. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, I see Lisa Markley coming up, so I think that's further discussion. I have a couple questions. Sure. Okay. And Shelly, stay there, please, because you're okay. probably better able to answer. So, sure. so um, is this a reimbursement up to seventy two hundred? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, who is the fiscal agent on this? You guys are the you're on the fiscal agent. So the match funding that's required on it is according to this, it's a fifty fifty match, correct? We aren't doing a match. I mean, we are not applying through Iowa Department of Public Health for a there is sometimes available funding under um, county boards. Um, but we have gone away from that process because of the issue of um, some counties can provide the match so <coughs> it can't be certain funds can be used at the county level. The, if I can try, the comprehensive grant from IDPH is a 100%, correct Shelley? It's a 100% from IDPH. We have a small match and yes. I don't know what it is but the contract is 18 uh, months rather than a normal year. In a normal year, when we did the, the grant um, on its, uh, when we did it without women in Story Counties, our match was like $5,000. From the total And it could be it. any kind uh, right. match from other people as long as it was a state and federal. This is additional funds that would, correct, would not be used for the match. Right. Correct. Well, this is supplement. Yeah, yeah, these are right. supplement. Right. Yeah. It's paid for at all through the grant. This is a request to pay for some enhanced services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have a motion, second. The motion was to go ahead and run it through the asset team. 
Um, would anybody be willing, would the two of you be willing to accept a time period on that as an amendment? I think we run through in the next, you said maybe next week? Yeah, I can see about getting a place on the agenda for next week, and it's usually beneficial, and I can talk to Shelley about this afterwards, having a CFR representative there to talk a little bit about it. So it would come back to us on February 12th as well. And I will not be here. That's right, yeah. Um, so, Shelly, what's your time frame? Um, we, I mean, we just needed to get our request in from this later 20. So okay. whenever you guys are wrapping that up, we would like to know. All right, because none of these funds would flow before July 1. Or be, or be, we requested before July 1, 2020. So then it doesn't seem like we're in a huge time crunch. So I'd say whenever Deb is available to be here at the meeting, would be the best time to do it. And show it. Okay. Okay. So, Market? Aye. Sanders? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Okay. Thanks, Shelly. Thank you. Okay. Next up on the agenda. Okay. Consideration of minutes, please. Yeah, I'll move to approval of the 20 minutes for the 22nd. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Sanders? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Olson? Aye. Okay. Consent? Yes. Are you guys good to go? Yes. We will take a five minute recess. Uh, so we'll be back here at uh, please, uh, 40, 38, 42. My right math. All right. Come to the microphone. I'm going to close the public hearing. Yeah, uh, so I'll move something. adoption of Ordinance 281 on its second reading and that we waive third reading, making this the final reading of Ordinance 281. Second. Okay. Further discussion? None. Sanders? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Olson? Aye. There you go, sir. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming out on the call. Yeah, board. really. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're now to item 8-1, discussion and consideration of resolution 1969, uncommitment of fund balance for conservation purposes. Lisa Markley. Good morning. So, Lisa? Um, I, we have the only time, um, so, so, so the Board of Supervisors um, does resolutions to assign funds and to commit funds. Um, in order to spend the committed funds, you have to uncommit those funds. That's not the same as for an assignment, but for a commitment it is. So what this request is asking today is to uncommit to $16,375.31 of the $1.6 million that was put into commitment of funds for conservation purposes. Okay. Questions? Yes, yeah, so I would move the uncommitment of funds. Any discussion? Sanders? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Okay, hey, you have direction there? Okay, I know because she, I think she's got a kitten in that cage, don't you? Yes, all right. So let's go ahead and move forward to discussion and consideration of resolution 1970 on commitment of fund balance for the motor grader lease. Lisa, go ahead. So, so I did this as a separate resolution just because um, originally the resolution for this commitment was done back in 19, I mean, what did we do this? 17, I think I saw it. 17 or 16 we probably did this um, because that's when they started that lease. Um, so in order to pay off the do, the, do the transfer, we need to uncommit these funds so the secondary rates can start on the Questions? I move approval of resolution 1970 and committing the funds for the secondary roads and motor grader lease. I second the motion. Discussion? Sanders? Aye. Perfect? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Emily. Okay, now we move down to discussion and consideration of process for announcing, scheduling, interviewing, and appointing, mem appointing members the Story County Boards and Commissions. And I brought this forward as a continuation of the discussion that uh, 
we had on January 2nd. At that time, we were discussing specifically the VA Commission and some comments that had come from a couple of the resigning members. And uh, it was uh, recommended uh, by Supervisor Merkin that we widen the discussion to everyone at the same time. And I put uh, an accompanying letter here to, to uh, recommend uh, the following process and participants for 2019 and 2020. I'm going to start with asking Deb Shilroff to come up. And Deb, if you can recap for us how, it's being, how it was being done in the past, how we've been doing it the last couple of years, uh, please. Currently, um, and I'll just start by saying we um, currently have one vacancy to one vacancy to fill on the planning and zoning commission, so that is advertised. We have a vacancy on the board of health that is advertised, and then two vacancies on the VA commission. So we have all of those um, vacancies to consider and, and application deadlines coming up, um, I believe in March and April. Mm -hmm. So we have some work ahead of us. Um, historically, <clears throat> how this has been handled is um, uh, uh, posting vacancies, applications are, are turned in to me, and then I hold those and make those available to all three board of supervisor members um, upon closing of the, <clears throat> of the vacancy. And then um, I go ahead and I schedule interviews with um, all of the applicants and <clears throat> Uh, the chair of the board of supervisors and I uh, meet with the applicant. We um, go through some questions and and um, gauge their interest and um, ability to meet the um, requirements of sitting on a board or commission. And then, upon completion of the interviews, a recommendation is brought to the full board of supervisors by the, the board chair. Okay. okay. So um, when. Uh, do you typically, or do you typically, uh, notify the uh, chair of the applicable board um, or commission uh, who the applicants are, or do they request to you for the information? I provide so upon closure of the uh, of accepting all the applications, I then provide all three board members with the applications. All three of the board of supervisors, but what yes. about the say the board of health, the con conservation board? Yeah, historically I have not provided those chairs unless they've asked. Um, the only exception to that would be the VA commission, and, and the Iowa code is very clear as to the involvement of of the VA commission with appointments to the um, to that particular commission. And so I've been forwarded applications to the VA. Uh, the chair of the VA commission as well when it's um, applicable to that. But the other, unless it's requested, um, I have not forwarded those. Okay. So now I probably turn to both of you, <laughs> right, as you're the two who are currently um, involved in the process. And, and how long has it been since um, since this particular process has been in, in use? So this, this, this particular process, so there, we've done it three different ways over four different spans since I've been here, the eight years I've been here. So when I first got here, we did not have um, uh, a director of external operations, and it was handled, put together by the board chair at that time. Uh, we would run it all through. We would actually do sequential interviews, I think this is being proposed here, um, and then the board chair would make a recommendation to the full board upon appointment. Um, then it changed to the process that we're currently using. Once we had a director of external operations, we went to that. And then for a short time in 2017, we went to a process where we were going to try to interview everybody out here. Um, and um, and then, then we went away from that and back to our previous way uh, of handling. Um, so um, as Okay, so I just I wanted to make note that um, I had initiated the process with interviewing in front of the, the public and the board. That did not work at all. So that was only in play for a short, short period of time, let you know, um, because it, it, I believe, had some, co people were rest, uh, were reluctant to want to be interviewed in full of a full, uh, full, in public. 
um, but that the board could only do the interview and hear the same questions in an open session. Um, so I just want to comment on, on that, that it was in an attempt to, on my part, to try and get the board back involved and other people like who were sitting on the boards of commissions. So that was my attempt in trying, trying that. It clearly worked out not to be successful very quickly. So just want to comment on that. So, um, so uh, all right, now please, Supervisor Sam. Yeah, so I, I was just going to go through what, what I'm reading that you're proposing mm -hmm. uh, that we do. And, and so I would just make a couple comments. One, I think your first bullet point, the submission, uh, after the submission deadline, that the staff, in this case, Deb, uh, would assemble and distribute copies of all the applications to all three of us. I think that's great. I think that's what we intend to do right now. I, I think that's perfect. Um, I'm not a fan of, of selecting blocks of time and, and sending people kind of on an assembly line for, to each of us. I think that gets awful close to a walking quorum if we're not careful. Uh, and I think it is cumbersome. It is, it's, it's uncomfortable for the applicant, and what we're really trying to get to is the best possible appointee. I trust our chair to continue to go through the process with the understanding that the other two supervisors are well within their purview if they choose to reach out to any applicant and say, hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee. I'd love to visit with you and meet you and try to build their own, uh, their own system. So that takes care of point number two from my perspective. Uh, and, and point number three, I don't like the sequential interviews. Um, I don't actually really like the idea of, of notifying the board or commission chairperson that we're talking about appointing. That's something we have not been doing except for the VA commission. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, we have conservation people sitting here. I think it makes a lot of sense for the conservation chair to be included through the process and then the conservation chair can share with their board whatever they do. I think it is really problematic if we go beyond including our boards and commissions um, in the process to creating a system where they are almost self-replicating. I don't think that's what we ever intended that we wanted to do. I think it's a, a board. It's, I think it's one of our decisions to make. But getting that feedback, I think, is important. Um, and you say forum there. I think you mean quorum. Correct. Oh yes. But, Sorry um, about that. And then. Um, I love the idea of the of the chairperson getting as many comments from as many people other than me and Linda mm -hmm. as possible. Uh, so I, I mean, I think that's something that we really try hard to do and should continue to do. Um, and then I think it's the chair's responsibility to bring forward the best recommendation for whatever reason that they can. And then it's the full board's responsibility to discuss that recommendation. That's uh, so I'm seeing one change that I like to our current process, and that is a, a notification of everybody who's applied to the board or commission chairperson for, for wherever that application is going. And that's my rationale. Okay, Supervisor Parker. Well, I probably have some different thoughts about this, so let me ask this first. I have, I'm sorry I'm not reviewed all of Chapter 331 of the code yet. Does the code say that the supervisor makes, that the chair of the board of supervisors makes recommendations on who serves on boards and commissions? No. Okay. It, Thank it, you. It's our process. It's yeah. our process. Okay. Yes. I have had, because I served on a commission, and I went through a different process, somewhat a hybrid maybe of what's being talked about right here. I think it is important that all of the supervisors get to meet the applicants. And I don't think it really is a good process to say, well, two of them could just ask them to come out for a, cup, for a cup of coffee. Because then we're really looking at not a process that was the one I went through, which was standard interview questions being asked. And even though board and commission members do not get any remuneration, including do not get mileage, anything else, you know, in terms of, you know, they still provide a very essential service. They make some very important recommendations, make some very important decisions on behalf of the county. So I really think that it, it makes sense for all the board members, if it's board responsibility, to appoint people for all of the board members to meet those applicants on the same on the same basis, which is a standard interview. 
which is what's done in an all employment situations anymore, is a standard interview with standard questions. Um, I don't think it has to be done sequentially, lots of time. When I was interviewed um, for Planning and Zoning Commission, I was interviewed by all three supervisors. I did not feel it was an imposition. Um, I, I personally would not have minded to have a public, you know, have publicly be interviewed, but since it is not a salaried position, I can see why some people might think that goes too far. But personally, as a, as a supervisor, I would like to have the opportunity to interview people who are interested in being on our boards and commissions and to be able to weigh in on an equal basis on the decision. Um, I wouldn't think that, that, and if that kind of situation were what we looked at, I wouldn't um, place it upon the board chair to make a recommendation since all three board members would have the same information. Can you clarify the would place it upon? So, um, this, so rather than board chair bringing forward saying, um, I nominate um, Joe, I think any board Jane. member, if, this, if the process is the same, I think any board member should be able to make a nomination. Okay, so let's go back here to the process that happened the one time, one time which was the chair, uh, I made a recommendation, it died for lack of a second, and then the chair, the chair had come in with a nomination. No, you hadn't, as a matter of fact, that was done from there. So what you're saying is you prefer that the agenda item just be um, selection or appointment, if you pull appointment of uh, planning and zoning or Board of Health, right? And then um, I entertain or you entertain or Rick entertain, okay, because I kind of covered 2019 and 2020, all right? So um, I entertain motions um, for a nominee for the appointment and somebody would make a motion or I make a motion. So I'm trying to work that through in my head about where's the any, starting point. I think any of the supervisors could make a motion, so, including the chair. Yeah, so I, um, I believe that in our current process that is still possible, but, but the chair has the ability to put on the agenda, here is the nomination, and if that nomination doesn't go anywhere, then it's open right. for other nominations, but it, uh, it keeps us out of a potentially really awkward situation unless it's just unless that's where we have to go um, uh, and, and so I was one of the supervisors Linda that interviewed you when you came through for the planning and zoning right. commission you're dang straight I've been here since 2010 <laughs> and, um, yes, I, know you and um, I will tell you that that was a really cumbersome awkward process the board used to get together and determine which questions each board member was going to ask um, no, you all so ask the same questions. It was, it was uh, that's not the way the process was. It was, uh, yeah, I, I'm just telling you, I mean, maybe we had the same conversation, but I can remember vividly being back there and um, one of the supervisors talking about, okay, you're going to ask this question and you're going to ask this question and, and you know, you handle this. And it, um, it was very uh, problematic. <laughs> to say the least. Um, I believe that when we elect our board chair every year, we bestow upon that board chair certain uh, responsibilities for us that's external to the code. It's, it, the code does not clearly spell out every single way we're gonna operate, but we gotta operate to the most uh, productive point possible to making a decision, and I believe that this is one of those areas that the least cumbersome way to get to a decision, the way that doesn't hang members of the public potentially out to um, public discomfort if, if, if uh, we're going to sit up here and talk, well, boy, I really like Joe Smith. Well, no, I didn't like Joe Smith. I like Nancy Jones. And you go through that. I, do, I, I think it hurts rather than helps our process of trying to have the best board possible. I'm completely consistent in this. I believe that this was the right process when I was the board chair, and I believe it's not the right process even though, I mean, I believe it's still the right process even though I'm not the board chair. I trust our board chair to, to help guide us through this process and get us to a, a great outcome. Um, 
and, and so wherever we end up, I, I feel pretty strongly about this. I've been, like I say, I've been through four different systems, and I believe that this one, if we add in notifying the current commission or board chair, I believe it's the least cumbersome while still gathering as much input as we can. Um, and I would say this, as far as professional interview, um, at least when I was involved doing it, Deb Shildroff runs a great professional interview um, and um, I, I, I believe you look at our boards and commissions. We got some really solid boards and commissions. I think we just made some really good appointments to our boards and commissions. And if the proof is in the pudding in terms of what our boards and commissions look like, I'd put them up against just about anybody. One of my questions in this was going to be whether there would be a standard interview questionnaire. And I was assuming that you know Deb in her role would be putting, would be providing that to the board members. And no, I can see if you were sitting there and saying who's going to ask what questions, I would not at all say that was appropriate because that can get into then you have to share answers, then you get into deliberation, which you should not be doing 100%. except in public meetings. So I can see why you were uncomfortable with that, and that's not the kind of process that I was suggesting. And maybe another thing, quite frankly, that comes to me is if I'm voting on something, honestly, I want to have equal, I think all board members need to have equal information if they're voting on something. So I have a question about that, um, just from the comment about, so we all ask the same questions provided uh, by staff accumulating those based on probably each one of our feedback to her about what is it, what I, here's what I'd like to ask, and so that we get one standard kind of list of questions, okay, assembled, uh, Deb puts together. But, but does that prevent us from asking a follow up question based on the answer? And I'm almost looking back, okay, there's a yes, Alyssa, please, because I know we got standard questions for the one that came up here. Um, so are we prevented then from asking that follow-up question that might make the difference? Follow-up questions are okay. okay. The, the issue is if you ask the applicants different questions. Okay. So if you want clarification on one of their answers, that is absolutely okay. If you ask them a completely different question and you ask the next applicant, there, there's a real issue with that. You, and want, you want to be consistent, you want to ask all the applicants the same questions. But if you, you know, want to dive into their answer a little bit more, or whether it's their you know, experience or different things, and they just they didn't elaborate enough, you're okay in asking all of the questions. And as long as it doesn't turn into a whole new question. Correct. And that was my concern. It, it, it needs to pertain to their the, the initial question they, and their answer. So has that been, with just the board chair doing that, is that how it has gone so far from your experience? Supervisor Sanders, I mean, are you going in with the same list also? Yeah, we have the, we've had the same conversation with every single applicant okay. for right. position. Regardless. Okay. Thank and you. That doesn't mean we don't have follow-up questions. It just means we right. don't ask new questions. We ask. We have asked for expansion of that. I'll just tell you guys, I am much more comfortable in my role now sitting over here, uh, a back venture or a side venture or whatever you want to call it. I am much more comfortable with taking the opportunity to go out and have an informal conversation with whoever our applicants are without asking them any, any interview questions and just get a feel and trust our board chair and our staff to get to the bottom of what where we need to be. And then if I have discomfort with what that is, I'll express it out here. Um, so so um, I'd like to come ask a couple of follow-up questions. All right. So, um, the responsibility of so if each of us um, uh, interviewed, um, and I put it in se a sequential thinking it was easier on staff and the applicant as opposed to trying to make a connection of, of individually scheduling times. Um, so if, if we looked at um, a hybrid a little bit that Requiring is the wrong word because we can't require each other to do much, right? But um, uh, if we looked at rather than having staff schedule the sequential times and instead each supervisor scheduled their own times to go out and, and have coffee with you, okay? Um, uh, 
does that less work for you, Deb, as, as you know, the staff person for right now, you know, for, for this time period we're talking about, and, and um, uh, comfortable for um, Supervisor Merkin and Supervisor Sanders about just rescheduling instead, but making sure everybody does talk to every applicant? Well, but, but, so what I'm hearing the disconnect between Linda and I in this is I, I believe, and Linda, you help me if I'm missing this, Linda likes the idea of all three board members being part of the formal interview process in some way, and I don't. Okay. And, and so I don't know that it's a scheduling issue as much as it is a philosophical, are all, so Linda, you said just a minute ago you want all three board members to have, or like all three board members to have the same information on anything we decide, and what I'm gonna tell you is that's, that is, uh, completely unrealistic and undoable. There are so many issues, depending on the issue, where one of us, because of our interests or our roles and responsibilities, outs off away from this board table, that we're going to have a lot more information. Let me, if I may, sure. When this, the statement you made, when possible. Okay. Good. And I think this is a place where it is possible that all board members could have the same information. Yeah. Basically information based on the same process. I know that it's not always going to happen, but when it's possible, when it's to do it, I think it should be. Um, I've expressed before that I believe it is one of our responsibilities as a member of the board to try and make contact. Um, now, I ended up doing a hybrid of it. I called some people um, on the phone. Um, I had coffee with a couple people, so I, I mixed it up. Um, if I knew the person already well, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you know, so I, I, I went along, tried to go along with that area of it. So, um, so for me, it's the uh, formal. We all agree that we will talk to every one of them versus the less formal about is that. Um, uh, it's up to you, um, if you're not board chair, whether you want to interview each applicant or not, or have talk to them on the phone or have coffee with them, but that each would, uh, yeah, have some consistent data, and I and and maybe it's the answer is to expand the questions on the application for consistent data. All right, but I do believe that all three supervisors are the people who should be involved. And then I believe that at least that the board chair of the applicable board or commission um, and or members of the, that board or commission, because that really is up to them who they want to send, right, to, to the board chair interview, I guess, to look at that. Or, as I originally designed it, was that if everybody's doing sequential and, you know, one person could make an interview at one time. So, but I, I did look at that from it being the board responsibility. So, um, so uh, it's the, is it really about the formality so much as the information about them? Well, I would say that there's one other thing. I think the process by which we, we select our board and commission members says something about the county. And we want professionalism from our volunteers. I think having a professional, consistent process by which we select our volunteer board and commission members gives that impression. And I think we're doing that now. I think we've I don't been think going that. out for coffee and asking various well, different that questions. Well, that is that is the other board's, uh, the other supervisor's choice. I'm saying the formal process that Story County uses today conveys exactly what you're saying we need to convey. It's a very professional, very buttoned down process. I would expect that to continue. Even if we don't change anything, I would expect that to continue. And what is that exactly? Because that, is that the supervisor right, is, to, is to follow through? Or is there an expectation that a staff member will be there? Because I expect that we, the supervisors, should be doing the work, not having a staff person required there. That, I mean, that's part of it, okay? So professionalism as Well, so I get really concerned. If you're saying, now if we're, ch if we're changing this to saying uh, not only are all three supervisors going to ask the same sheet of questions, but we're each going to do it independent 
without any staff member there, Alyssa or Deb. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed it running through Deb. I've enjoyed Deb making sure that our process was exactly what Linda just expressed she was interested in, which is professionalism, consistent, uh, and we could get to a decision based on reliable, consistent information. If we're talking about now changing that to where we don't have staff involved in anything more than a clerical, put together paperwork kind of thing, I get really concerned about that because in my mind that we need to have a process that is consistent regardless of the three people sitting here, right? The board of suit and in order to do that, there is a staff component to that that I would hate for us to lose. So I if if that was on here, I missed it. I was not taken that we were going to exclude a staff member from being part of the process. Okay, well, I, it's on here where I say BLS and staff. It's very clearly separated out about what are staff duties and what are board of supervisor duties. So that's, that I didn't take out, so okay, um, on that. So, um, so in that case, then who's the applicable staff person? from a, um, should it maybe be Alyssa instead because of, of it being the HR, you're looking for the same questions, you're looking for the HR component, um, so maybe that's where the shift is. And then- It could vary, I mean, I think that case could easily be made for me. Uh, it was our director of external, when we set this up, the rationale behind the director of external operations is um, that all of our boards and commissions are in essence external even though they don't necessarily report through that position in some cases our staff members that work most closely with those boards and commissions do report through that external position i think you could make a case that it's an hr the beauty with our two staff members over here is they are both eminently professional and would make sure that we run a great process so i would say i would like to have one or two i like it the way it is right now where Deb Shildroth is the point person from the staff working with the chair of the board to get us through the process. If you guys wanted to change that to Alyssa, I would, I would uh, absolutely be amenable to that. I will struggle if you say we want to exclude the staff. Okay. Supervisor Mark, weigh in if you care to. Um, I think um, I have no comment. All right, so any other things here? I think the primary question, I think all the other details get worked out depending on an option. I see there's two options that we're talking about. Um, what I'm suggesting is an option where all three supervisors do a interview of each applicant with standardized interview questions. Um, what I am hearing Supervisor Sanders say is that he feels the Board of Supervisors chair and a staff person should do that. I've, um, I think I've plenty in terms of why I have the feelings that I do about it. So I guess it's just that we, you know, I think all the other things we've talked about, staff involvement being important, that kind of thing. So I think those those decisions can be fleshed out after we just decided we're going to have three supervisors interview or are we going to have the board chair interview. That's the first thing then we go from there. Okay, so that sounds like it's clearly separated out to one or another motion to start with. I'd move that we uh, develop a process where all three supervisors would individually interview each applicant for board and commission. Yeah, and so I'm going to second it for uh, for discussion, and I'm just going to say I'm, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I think it gets us dangerously close to uh, crossing the line on walking mm -hmm. forms, and I'm not going to participate in a formal interview. I, I will absolutely do my due diligence and make sure that I'm comfortable uh, or uncomfortable with any of our applicants, but I'm going to go through my own process um, to get there regardless of what we do here because I feel strongly that, that this is problematic. Um, 
I, 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 I strongly feel that all three supervisors need to be involved. Mm -hmm. And um, I hear what you're saying about um, what you're calling informally, um, which to you informally means don't ask the same questions. Is that correct? Because that seems to be the difference, whether you have, you, know, you could, we all three could go have coffee with someone. Um, and that's a process, you know, but it's what questions we're using. Is that not correct? That's it's what information we are eliciting through questions. And I believe that it's much more transparent what the process is when you have something that is uniform and consistent. Otherwise, you don't know what process, what the process was. And, and um, I, I so appreciate, Linda, that point of view, and I will just simply say this. Each one of the three of us were elected to make the best decisions that we could on any topic. Any time we're making a decision, we get to make the best decisions we can based on whatever we deem is important individually, right? We don't all make decisions based on the same set of data, and we sure don't analyze that uh, data the same way. And uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that whatever process you guys determine we're going to use, I, every, with every one of our applicants, I'm going to go down the road of figuring out if they are acceptable to me. And it's, it is a simple yes or no. I'm not even going to go down the road of figuring out who I want more. I'm going to say either this applicant is acceptable in my mind or not acceptable. And then I'm going to trust our chair to make a recommendation based on what they find. And if it falls into the acceptable category, I'm going to vote yes. And if it falls into the unacceptable category, I'm going to express that I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, I think that we can find a better fit. And so I'll vote no on whatever that recommendation is. And that's the process that I'm going to choose to use for our, in my role on the board right now, in our role for appointing these boards and commissions, I'm completely comfortable with that role for me. I'm completely comfortable with making my decision based on that. And again, I'm, I'm not viewing this as a, when I was board chair, I felt like it was my responsibility to try to identify the absolute best fit possible on a lot of criteria for every one of our boards and commissions. And that's exactly what I think it's our board's chair's responsibility to do now. Sitting where I am now, I think it's my responsibility to make sure that whatever that recommendation is, is an acceptable recommendation. And then I express that with my vote. That's the way I view me, it. It's important to me that you think about non-merit factors. Mm -hmm. And the phrase, a better fit, mm -hmm. always gives me pause. So it's very subjective. But I do agree that each one of us, as we vote, do that. The question is, what at what? What's the process for us to get to make that determination about using our own judgment about what is the best fit? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, so I I do support have, starting um, with having three, all three of us, and all three of us having a uniform set of questions. What we do with those questions or whether we choose to exercise even the interview, we can't force each other to do, correct? Am I, I mean, just that, that's the way it's code is, and various attorneys I've consulted with have, have indicated that, okay, that there's, so, but we can't say here's the process we want to use. And um, for that, to say all three supervisors are, are expected to be involved, but they don't have to be. All these supervisors were going to be given a standard sheet. Now, I'm going to turn to Alyssa again here uh, for HR, and I'm wondering if this needs to be run, you need to have a discussion with maybe our county attorney or our civil attorney about what happens if two of us use a uniform uh, and you know, sheet of questions and another one doesn't use the sheet of questions. Are we really open to liability since it's a volunteer position? I would, I would have to agree with you on that. I, you know, as far as there being any complaints, there could always be complaints of um, a, a civil rights complaint. It could be filed if they felt like 
you know, there was some sort. I've never seen it so, with the boards and commission. It could, it could be with services that the county provides. It's not just employees. Um, the county can get, get a complaint from anything, okay. technically. Now, would that be considered part of the actual interview process that's legally? I mean, if they choose not to participate in that process, but yet they want to just you have an informal conversation, that would be up to, to legal to me. Um, yes. it, it, it's dependent on that. If, if that person, I, I don't think each individual supervisor has to ask the exact same questions to each applicant. All right. What you ask, all three applicants need to be the same. What Rick asks, all three applicants and what Rick asks. Okay, you can yeah. ask, each supervisor can ask a different set of questions to determine their viewpoint as to whether that, that applicant is who they want to recommend or, or get into that position. That's an interesting yeah. point. But I would also wonder if you wouldn't want to look at the set of questions a supervisor wanted to ask to make sure that there weren't any non-merit factors that and, might creep into questions. And I've done that in the past. I have reviewed all the questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. I think that's... I think that makes sense to me. So I'm happy to reach out if, if, if the board wants me to reach out to legal. I think that, does that answer your question, Loris, as far as the, having the same questions? You just, you don't want to have some, you don't want to ask each other different questions. I want you to ask them all the same questions. Uh, okay, yeah. I want you that, to, that, if, that, if that you're doing it in we've done that, that, we've that, done that in the, the same same process. All right, you know, so when we're hiring department heads, you each right. have a specific Set of questions they're not the same questions but if you have three or four applicants you're asking all three or four applicants the same questions each individual supervisor so that clears it up okay. All right. okay now and then i want to go back to the individual board uh board of commission chairs that each uh and maybe their members they each whatever person it is has to ask the same questions but if a different member of the conservation board is sitting in two interviews and uh, Jim is sitting in two interviews, only Jim has to ask those two the same question, correct? And then the other conservation board member would ask maybe of their two people too, correct? Yeah, the, the suggestion is we're not asking different questions to different applicants. Because if, if you do that, it, it in turn looks like you're trying to get the answers you want. You're, you're you know, we, we need some consistency. So um, it, I just look at each person that's whoever is interviewing. Mm -hmm. If you have five applicants, ask them all the same questions. I think this has been a great discussion because things keep coming up that make a lot of sense and won't make this a better process. And I'm wondering if we, we have a motion right now on the floor, and I'm wondering if we, that motion, it seems, sets a direction. And I'm wondering, given our conversation, if we voted on that motion, if that motion were to prevail, I would suggest that maybe staff could work out, work out some of the details for it, mm -hmm. rather than us trying to work them all out right here this morning. Good suggestion also. So um, did I hear that as a call to question? A call to question. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, and the motion once again is, Shelly, can you read it back? <laughs> uh, I'm going to um, All supervisors interview applicants. That's the motion. It's not word for word. Yes, but okay. Yeah. So, all right. Okay. Um, and you can, yeah. You can amend it any way you want if you wanted to do that. I think I just assume leave it that simple. Based okay. on our conversation, I think we know where we're, we would, how we would flush it out. Okay. Perfect. Aye. Sanders? Nope. Olson? Aye. So, um, then our next are directions to staff. Mm -hmm. All right. And that would be, and the, I'm going to direct to both Deb and Alyssa, if that's comfortable for everyone. I mean, you know, good for you two to work together to come up with uh, uh, your suggested process from there uh, uh, as it goes on. Um, I'm going to ask 
paying attention to um, uh, the avoiding of a walking quorum, so consulting with legal about the avoidance of a walking quorum, and um, uh, instructions how it should be given to all people um, as far as uh, questions to ask and not ask. Okay, so that's... Yeah, and, and then just to note, um, we as a board don't have the authority to force compliance from another board. Correct. That, that is correct. That is correct. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Let's go ahead and we'll move on here. And the next item here is discussion and consideration of the ongoing role and membership of the Watershed Assessment Implementation Matrix Working Group. Right? And um, Leanne Harder here, it is our item for the supervisors. Once again, a follow-up conversation. I see here um, members of the group that are here are Leanne Harder, um, Deb Shildroth, um, Mike, Cox and Jerry Moore. So all four are here. All right. Um, the question first is uh, what would be the role going forward? The second question that I wanted to bring up was the addition of Margaret James uh, to the working group. Should it be decided that the working group would continue and under what terms? So I'll start with um, input from all four of the existing members of the group about whether you feel uh, the working group should continue and what you feel the next role or next uh, tasks, task would be to continue. So Mike, if you want to start first, and then uh, we'll go ahead and go with Gary, then uh, Deb, and then Leah. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I see these as two different things. Uh, the board at your pleasure established a group of individuals to develop an implementation plan. Part, and that was done, part of that implementation plan was then to develop an interdepartmental working group. Not necessarily the same group. Um, and so, you know, that's what that's what was uh, approved uh, by, I believe, all of the uh, boards and commissions that considered the implementation matrix is to develop that separate interdepartmental working group. So, um, and I'll just speak for myself in that, as part of the initial um, uh, group that developed this plan. Um, when we discussed this interdepartmental working group, um, I had in mind more individuals than were at the initial group, the four of us. Um, and so, yes, here's the, the folks that I see are those um, either elected officials, department heads that have um, some kind of water quality um, component in their in their respective roles. Um, and so that could be the uh, county engineer, it could be the planning and development director, it could be environmental health, it could be our floodplain manager, it could be someone from the conservation board, it could be someone representing the drainage district trustees and um, your body. So those are the folks that came to mind when, when at least for me, I was considering this group. And then uh, what do you see then the next uh, step or task for that group? Do you, uh, do you see it collectively maybe guiding our watershed efforts or something else? Again, I guess to take off where I left, each there, there's so many different um, aspects of what we do in county business, and many different roles or people, different people have roles and water quality. Well, 
those folks aren't necessarily all convening and discussing what we do as a concerted effort moving forward. And so the impetus here is to have that level of communication. And so that all of those folks are, are, are privy to uh, each other's, uh, I guess, uh, needs, uh, visions as they see fit, and uh, to, yeah, to work together to make some suggestions or to guide uh, at, uh, at overall county efforts. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see Leah Hire stepped up next, okay? So, well, I just, I agree with Mike, um, what he said. And <coughs> really the first role of that working group um, is along the lines of what Mike said, educating one another what we're doing and how we can, can move the, um, help assist move to move the matrix forward and the strategies are outlined. Uh, it actually predates all of you, and actually there's only a few of us in the room that will remember this, but we had the, well maybe Rick, the Go Green team. Um, uh, it, it was set up um, to really, we had a, a strategic plan on how we could implement um, sustainable practices throughout Story County government. The Go Green team was really that shepherd for lack of a better description of the, that strategic plan. Staff led, really, um, to bring the initiatives then to the board for approval or just implementation as well. And I see a similar similar type of um, process with this implementation matrix working group too. And I do apologize for my delay and, and coming up here. Our website went down, so I've been trying to scramble and get some news releases out there because it did go back up. So thank you, Leah. Um, so, uh, and I smiled because I was appointed to the Go Green team in 2017, but by then we didn't have a meeting. Um, it pretty much was down to recycling, who's going to help carry out the trash, right, on a regular basis for recycling. So that's interesting. Thank you for that. It's fine that you were having a struggle with the website. I mean, I was that. So, okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, Jerry, you want to go next and just tell me what you perceive of? And I don't know that I have that much to add other than what we and Mike added. Um, you know, I think the working group that was formed, we met several times, and I think we put together a really decent implementation matrix that the board of supervisors adopted. Um, I think we were interested and I, I'm sorry but I did not hear that I know Mike put money in the budget to fund a position to be the coordinator um, and then that person be the go-to person to communicate with the board and then I think we were, we were just excited to work with the potential partners that we list in that, in that matrix so um, you asked you know what else would we be doing I think initially it was just to get it to this stage and as you as the board knows there's a lot of work to do and the times that we met we talked about how important it was to have a central person that was employed and had that connection to Story County and that you know they could oversee um, the various aspects of the work that needs to be done and, and see that work that um, the relationships with these partnerships uh, worked out well and then you know, just communicating back to the board on the, on the success so so you mentioned a central person then could you see possibly the entities uh, that might listed being an ongoing advisory group Entities. Well, uh, you know, city, in, or, sorry, county engineer, PD director, um, conservation, somebody from the conservation board, or somebody from our board, uh, environmental health. Yeah. Could you see them as being sure. staying assembled as kind of an advisor? And working with a coordinator mm -hmm. position, sure. Okay. Absolutely. And then the other thing that I heard you say is that within the group, was it your kind of discussion impression that the person should be employed by Story County? Or 
I think that's something that, at least I, that's what I was envisioning, that would okay. be an employee of the county. Okay. All right. Thanks. I might have a follow-up. Because there are numerous potential partners listed at the back of the implementation matrix. And I don't want us to think that this is simply Story County's thing. I mean, I see the county leading, but if we just think this isn't something that county employees only are involved in, um, we can't control this world out there, you know, and we can't do everything. We've got watershed management authorities, we've got NRCS, we've got I Learning Forum, which I didn't see on the list, it's doing a lot of training in of people on cover crumbs. You know, I think I, almost everybody else, that was one I didn't see there. But I'm just thinking, how do we best pull all of these entities together, not just say, what is Story County as county government going to do, but what is Story County as everybody in Story County going to do? I kind of see you nodding. Well, and I don't know if I have an answer to that, and it might help me out, but um, yeah, I, the meetings that we had, we, we realized the scope and magnitude of all the things that need to be accomplished, and there, there is no way and that, that one person or that just the staff at Story County should be involved in this. There's, there's no way that that can happen and for this to be successful. We definitely have to reach out to, to these partners and we have to do this in a united fashion. I guess I would agree that, that uh, listen, the world of water, water quality improvement, flood mitigation, whatever you want to call it, is vast. It's, it's very broad, it's, it changes very rapidly, it's a dynamic world that we try to do the best we can in. The, I think again, the intent, our intent with this working group was not to necessarily set policy, was not to do that, was not to guide every effort of water quality um, improvements in the county, was not, um, because there are so many other partners involved that we need to work with. So we recognize that. We developed a list of all of the potential partners. It was quite an expansive list. Um, but the intent, again, with this group is just for the in-house, just for the county, direct county responsibilities as, it, as related to water quality. Not that there aren't external factors that, that have roles in um, but that each person on this group is going to know their respective external influences, but however, whatever they may be, and be able to bring that to the group. And again, that this group really act as a kind of advisory um, group um, to our own county purposes. So let me, and I agree that, but let me turn it maybe 45 or 90 degrees there. It's better than saying this group is an advisory group. I see this as the county's work group to do the things that need to be done within the county. And maybe some of those partners become our advisors, become the advisory group. Can I go? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so I appreciate that. I, I see it as two separate uh, components. So, so we've got two uh, major issues under our, or, or, or at least part of our purview. The first one is how Story County conducts business and what that impact to water quality is. And second is how we are part of, and maybe a leading part of, the conversation countywide for all impacts to water quality. And I think the budget that conservation put forward recognized the beginning of both of those things. I'm not saying they were in the right places necessarily, but it, it talked about the county hiring a position that was responsible to Story County for Story County's practices and how we do things. And that was a, uh, that was a new position in the budget. And then the second thing that conservation had in was a component for practices. And part of that, I think it was $50,000 of that, was to form an external relationship to start to pull these partners together to look at everything that's going on in the county and start to build this 
this coalition. I'm, I appreciate that Leanne talked about the Go Green Committee. I think there's some similar, similarities here, but I look at Todd in the back and the Safety Committee and say this is, in my mind, this is much more similar to safety and how we do it in Story County than it is anything else. Um, as far as this group goes. So we had a safety committee that was formed long before we created a position to bring in a safety director. And they went through the work of trying to figure out what we needed to be doing within Story County. Doesn't mean we didn't want the rest of the county to be safe. And part of that group was key staff members, it included a board member, but it also included some external help from a relationship we had, in this case it was with Nat Tedesco, that helped us with that committee. And I view, so I think the the work of that initial work group that, that we put together is done. I think that thing is over, and I think we're talking about forming a new implementation group that in my mind would include really the people that Mike laid out. Um, it would absolutely include an appointee from the Board of Supervisors. I would think we would be best served by appointing our person who was involved in watershed authorities, but we could appoint anybody we wanted to that group. It would also include appointee from the conservation board because I think more than any of our other areas uh, that, that has its own separate decision-making role from the board of supervisors, conservation is gonna fill that. And I think it would also include an external component from whatever entity the county decides to work with in creating these partnerships and encouraging practices outside of county specific property um, and I would suggest that that either be with somebody we have a current work relationship with or that we do a full uh, RFP in order to get to that and that be the makeup of our committee here in the county again viewed much more similar to the safety committee we've got a lot of work to do and we're not going to get there anytime soon but the only way we're going to make progress is to take one step at a time and I believe the two most appropriate first steps are hiring a full-time position within Story County whose responsibility is to coordinate Story County's efforts for water quality, and then also look at developing a contract relationship with somebody external who can help pull together not only what we're doing in Story County, but what's going on in the rest of Story County, outside of Story County government, um, I believe we've got a good model for that in our two created watershed, well, two of our three created watershed authorities. Um, and um, I'm a huge fan of not reinventing the wheel. But that's where I think we are. And to me, the decision point should be, um, do we want to create this committee, and I'm calling it a committee, um, and if so, who would be on it? Do we want to have a full-time county position, and if we do, who would it report to, or multiple, would it have dual reporting lines, much like Joe Quaker does with IRBM? Um, and then finally, do we want to go down the road at looking at forming a contractual relationship with somebody external to Story County to help us with the rest of Story County? Could the uh, person who reports to the committee, the full-time assistant reports to the committee? I find that problematic. Um, I, so Jerry Moore does not report to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, Margaret Jaynes, I think, has dual, kind of dual reporting lines, I mean, to the Board of Health, but also has responsibility to the county. Um, uh, Todd doesn't report to the Safety Committee. Uh, so I prefer to see, my vision, and I'll just throw it out there, my vision is it would have dual reporting lines to the Director of Conservation and um, our Director of External Operations is how I see this position making the most sense. That gives it a very direct line to the Board of Supervisors, and it also gives it a direct line to our Conservation Board, which again, is a decision-making body, it's not an advisory body. So, Jumped a couple of steps there. I and think. then I, when I can, I'd like to come here. Okay, so I, um, I, I not initially in favor of, I'll just say that initially in favor of, um, the person reporting to conservation alone. I'll say that, okay? Which and you didn't suggest that, all right? But I, I just want to explain that with, since you have some independent authority of your own, um, I don't want that person to be reporting to a board that can go off in a different direction. So I'm more in favor of reporting 
um, either dually, you know, as a double, and I'm wondering how that works because conservation has a lot more authority than the Board of Health, or at least that's how it's been set up here in Story County, about going off and making your own strategic decisions. So I'm just headed here, okay, to then reporting to the Board of Supervisors and maybe conservation joint. This seems more practical about that. So then the question becomes, in reporting to the Board of Supervisors, um, is it to go directly to us or is it to go through the Director of External Operations? And, um, and so that I'm opening for discussion about um, which is which seems to be the most logical way given that it's also reporting to I guess it would be my the person would be reporting to my cops who's reporting. Is that not correct? It wouldn't be too directly to the conservation board but to my cops. So Joe Quaker IRVM reports to my cops but has responsibility to Darren Moon as well. Correct. The primary responsibility and formal formal reporting is solely through But Joe, but with that, Joe Quaker is not a standalone independent. He has responsibility to Darren Moon, who doesn't have responsibility to conservation. Correct. And one of my concerns about through another person to the Board of Supervisors is just the flow of information and direction. And the same thing with, with conservation to a certain extent. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about what uh, Supervisor Murphy said about reporting to this new working group instead, which there would be representatives from everybody on. And, and maybe it's maybe it's the dotted line on the TO yeah. kind of thing, because I don't know that this committee is going to be a hiring entity that's going to do performance evaluations, do all of those things necessarily. What I'm trying to get at, and it's maybe bringing it up a bit to the you know level of what's the goal, what and, and, and how are we going to, what do we need to do here to make sure it's everybody, everybody understands their relationship. And I'm afraid if you put a, a position solely in one department. That it is then looked at as well as that department's responsibility to make sure that our water quality improves. And then everybody else kind of takes a bye. You know, I think it is that when I go back and I look at that watershed assessment, there are so many places in the county, there are so many departments that, that touches that I want to make sure everybody feels their ownership and their responsibility. And that's and that's my struggle there of putting the position in one department and maybe maybe you need to do that administratively management why say that it, the position is in this department but you have that dotted line on the TO that says the purpose of this position is administratively in this department for employment evaluation whatever purposes but that direction overall direction comes from this committee who is charged with making sure that the county, all the departments of the county implement this plan. Or it, our direction, final direction, comes from the Board of Supervisors, but the committee itself being the intermediary. So it's not a lot different than Jerry Moore's position right now. So Jerry Moore does not report to the Planning and Zoning Commission, but runs his work program through the Planning and Zoning Commission. He takes direction is the wrong word, but but almost takes direction from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Jerry Moore works for Deb Shildroth, who works for the Board of Supervisors. Um, and frankly, that's the way I like this position the best is have it directly report to our Director of External Operations, but with responsibility so it's kind of flipped on its head from Joe Quaker, with responsibility to conservation, but the the beauty about it reporting through our director of external operations is she also has some of the other entities that um, would be involved in this group who report to her. Um, I am not in favor of creating a new position that reports directly to the board. It's taken us years to get to the point 
that we have more of a horizontal rather than, or more of a vertical rather than a horizontal flow chart. Um, and again, I go back to what I said in one of our earlier conversations. It is our responsibility to set a system that is not dependent upon the makeup of this board to be effective and, and functional on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we achieve that um, through a joint reporting line with primary and, uh, oversight and responsibility being our director of external operations. I, I'm, I don't want this position to get too far away from this committee. That's my only problem with that. Do you think Jared Moore is too far away from the Planning and Zoning Commission? You've got first-hand knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I agree with that analogy totally of using Jerry's position because that is one, one facet of county operations, planning and development, planning and zoning. We are talking about lots of different facets of operations here. But what, I want to, what I'm looking at there is that I think this committee is very, very important because it holds us all accountable to each other and holds this position accountable to, to that whole process. It is a process, it is a work that is going to take very many parts of the, of the county as well as the external entities. I agree with you completely. So I really don't, I want this committee to be, I want that to be a strong dotted line on the TO, however, however the, the position is placed. So would you accept Todd as a suitable uh, comparative analogy to this position? Safety touches in lots of different places, we've got to go everywhere with it. Todd works with conservation, Todd works with everybody in the county, he reports to Alyssa Wignall because that is an in internal function but he has very strong ties and very strong responsibility to our safety committee. I think that's a, a better analogy, or a better you know, a connection or comparative on that, I do, given that Todd interacts with a, a lot of different people directly also. You know, it, it is a strong position with um, some independent authority slash expertise based upon the topic of safety and was brought in for that. So I, I like that better, okay? So you're talking about the position reporting directly to the Director of External Operations? Yes, with, with more than a dotted line, joint responsibility, but not hiring authority or, or uh, um, job evaluation directly lying with conservation. But we have to have a foot in both places. Okay, I just got lost. So, so who would the, would the employee be a board of supervisors, office employee? Yes. Okay, yes. To, to director of external operations, but what I'm, so the way Joe Quaker works, he has joint report, reporting responsibility, but his primary area is to conservation. I'm flipping this one on its head, and I'm saying this is joint reporting joint responsibility, but its primary reporting is through the Director of External Operations rather than the Conservation Board. That said, I think there is a substantial oversight and direction that can come from conservation, because if we're not pulling those two entities together, Board of Supervisors and Conservation, we're not going to get anything done. Right. What happened to the committee that, that uh, was being recommended? That's still that's still there. That's that's, that's internal to Story County, much like our safety committee is internal to Story County. Okay. But reporting though, it's very clear Todd reports to Alyssa. I mean it's very clear and no matter what the you know, and the safety committee is it conservation is represented on the safety committee, in fact it's Joe, I'm speaking of, all right. So but but there's um, uh, Todd's only reporting to one person. Okay, which, which, um, and the safety committee. The safety committee is giving the marching orders. The safety committee is setting direction, and then the safety committee uh, then brings it to us. If, if, if when it gets to a certain level, correct? It's usually an individual motion or an individual recommendation on programming or something. So, 
this position in following that model would, would go through external director of operations, okay? um, not have dual reporting though because conservation would be on the committee, yes. correct? In fact, the way this is set up, I, I think conservation gets two positions. Just running off of Mike's list, which I like, all right, was one would be Mike, and one would be one of the board of members of conservation. Then Mike also suggested, well, a supervisor, and also you said a drainage trustees, but there's only three of us, so we can't, there can't, two of us can't be on the same committee, right, okay? So we would have a voice. So it's a strong committee just like the safety committee is. Right, right. so the difference that I see. Okay. Jerry, are you still playing manager now? Or Leanne, are you still playing manager? Leanne is. Leanne is, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I would say the difference between safety um, and uh, water quality is um, that we have certain components within the county that every single area is relying upon, but they don't have direct responsibility for. And I would say safety, human resources, IT, I'm sure there's more. So conservation, and I'm gonna use conservation because that's what we're talking about here, um, has to adopt our, or that have to, but they generally adopt our human resources policy and they utilize our human resources to get anything done. They adopt or should adopt our safety uh, policies and procedures, uh, but they don't have a direct, it is not part of their mission, it's, it's part of the thing that they have to do to operate, human resources, IT, and safety. Water quality and water quality issues are part of the absolute mission that we charge conservation with, and it's why I view this position differently in regard to conservation than I do safety or IT or uh, human resources. I am so confused. I'm, I'm sorry. I've heard several things here. First, I said, are you suggesting the employee be under the director of external operations? I thought I heard a yes then. Yeah, now I'm hearing you talking about the employee being in conservation department. Mike, do you report to the director of external operations? No. No. Okay, so that's why I'm confused. Yeah, there's here. no confusion here. I've been clear all the way through. Okay. Reports to, has, has primary reporting to the Director of External Operations, but a joint reporting line to conservation, like Joe Quaker, has primary respo reporting responsibility to conservation, but also jointly reports to our engineer. I'm just flipping it. I'm saying there needs to be a very direct tie to conservation from this position. If we're truly going to try to get out of it what we want to get out of it, uh, I just think it's really, really important, and I'm completely good with it not being housed in conservation or even having primary reporting to conservation, but it has to have some direct tie to conservation beyond the fact that conservation is going to have at least one and maybe two members of this committee. So what's very vague, though, what is some, not on the end of the department, and report to the department, but have some tie other than? I don't understand. I mean, we're talking about a very vague concept there. I don't understand what you're saying, Rick. Yeah, I don't think it's that vague. With Joe Quaker, it, it's because one person, Joe, is doing two basic different jobs, or connected jobs, but those jobs are under two different departments. Am I accurately describing Joe's mm -hmm. role? Yes. Joe's, again, like Rick said, Joe's, Joe's uh, reporting responsibility is formally, is solely to be. However, um, part of his workload is directed by the engineer. And so there is communication between the engineer and I on, on working with that position and, and tasking that position. Um, because he is, he ultimately does have some level of responsibility in both of those departments. So let's let's be more specific. Um, his responsibilities under engineering are related to the to the clearing out of ditches and drainage ditches. Correct? Is that a, enough of a? Not really. All right. Okay then. Um, 
Joe's responsibility under engineering is uh, erosion control, um, right of way, uh, vegetation management, etc. Joe's responsibility under conservation is drainage ditch management, uh, and uh, if you will, the, the kind of the vegetation choices, etc., uh, that he uses in all of his roles, uh, and so so that's really the, the derivation. Of it, is that the secondary reference is is, uh, is right of way. Uh, he manages those right of way. It, using principles and direction from uh, conservation uh, with the caveat that uh, some of the engineers um, considerations have to come into play in that um, i.e. where native prairie is planted you can't plant it everywhere and you have to be mindful of safety concerns and visibility etc um, but when the engineer does a ditch cleanup on a regular basis, uh, then Joe works specifically with the engineer on that uh, as far as tasking and, and uh, uh, work order uh, development, et cetera, on getting those um, engineer uh, derived responsibilities completed. Could I make one order? It's 12 o'clock right now. Our building is closing at 1 p.m. to the public. Um, I don't think we're going to make a decision about this today. I'm not sure how. I think we have some things that we agree on. One thing I've heard is we want a central person to oversee the county's work. We have questions about. Well, I don't know that we agree upon that, right. but. Well, you know, then maybe we don't. So, are you moving toward let's put it on a future agenda? I'm moving towards let's put it on a future agenda, but trying to figure out how we don't go over the same ground again. I'm not sure that's possible. But Probably not, but. Um, um, I have a lot of interest in this. Obviously, I would be willing to try to work with somebody on a proposal. I don't know if that's the way that we want to do it, but I would be willing to work with staff on a proposal to try to put something together that at least, at least had some of the ideas that we've talked about today. I, I don't know if that's a way to do this or not. I'm just thinking where or maybe we need to ask the committee to come back and give us a more specific proposal. That might be the better way to do it now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, so I, Linda, I couldn't agree with you more. So I said, I think when I started this, that I thought that initial committee was at the end of their work. I think what I'm hearing right now is that initial committee is not at the end of their work. Uh, but I would ask, Linda, that, that you work with that existing committee uh, to draft some recommendations that we would consider um, and that we get it on our agenda as quick as we possibly can um, to have that full conversation. Actually, I'd have said that first if um, the exception though is I'd like to add Marva James to it also to that group. So that would be the group of Mike Cox and Jerry Moore, Deb Shildroff and Leanne Harder and Marva James to work with um, Supervisor Merkin to put together uh, more of an ideal or a couple of options, uh, suggestions about what it might look for reporting. Now, Leanne is back there shaking her head. Would you like to say something, Leanne? No, she asked me a question. I asked her a question. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. I thought maybe you were like, don't give me one more thing or I'll just absolutely never leave the building. Okay. So. I think there will I have some strong feelings about this, but I seem to commit this to staff that this is not a way for me to try to get my way on this issue, or this is what I'd like to see. I'd just like to be interested in trying to help facilitate a process, if okay. that's acceptable to people. So I think it's completely acceptable, but I think it's fine if you have very strong feelings that you want to... The beauty for us here in Story County is we have really strong staff. I mean, we have really strong staff, and they're going to be very willing to 
to give you their opinions regardless of what yours are, and I think that's the way we get to the best possible answer. Um, and so, I, Linda, I don't even need your caveat on there. I, I think you're the right person to work with them, and we see what comes back, and then, hey, I promise you this, if I disagree, I'm gonna tell you guys yes, that I disagree. Yes, you will always so, yeah. your voice, that is true. So, all right, are we in agreement that that's the direction we're going to give to staff and to supervisor Murphy? All right, that's great then. Um, we, of course, are not gonna go ahead and carry on with the next two one uh, on the agenda, so we'll just jump right over that one, F2 and including consideration. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're going to go to uh, number 10 now for animal control quarterly report. Well, 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 we've got to do the uh, construction evaluation papers. I'm sorry, I jumped over that. Really that. Close. Huh? Yes, okay. All right, so we have moved up discussion and consideration of the ongoing role and membership of the watershed assessment implementation matrix working group. No. No, 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 I'm sorry. Construction evaluation resolution. It's not on my agenda because I downloaded it. Okay, so I would do this just in the interest of time. So Story County has passed the construction evaluation resolution every year since 2003. Many years we've done it on our consent agenda. I think this is an important tool. It is the only tool that counties have to have a voice in any proposed master matrix. Um, and so I would move approval of resolution 1957, uh, construction evaluation resolution. Oh, second. Second discussion. Um, both questions. Sanders. Aye. Murphy. Aye. Olson. Aye. I'd like to see animal control up here. She's coming. She's bringing we got show and tell today. I love show and tell. She's bringing a gift today, and I'll start this if you don't mind. Okay, yeah, that's great. So, so Sue, you brought us a gift. Talk to us about it, please. Okay, well, it's actually one of the items on on my agenda, which is number seven: animals in the cold, snow, and wind. So I wanted to kind of bring everybody an example of Supervisor Sanders. Will you be coming back? Should we wait for you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, sorry about that. Okay, so this guy, a couple weeks ago when we had our first temperatures below zero, was found as a stray um, out by Peterson Pits. He was sitting on the middle of the road. People had seen him for several days and I think they could catch him. And finally he hunkered down right in the middle of the road on a dead end and said, I don't know what's going to happen, but it, I've got to, there's got to be something done here. He, he's got two weeks of us feeding him everything he wants, and he's this thin yet. Okay. So, not only is that terrible in itself, he's a very, very friendly, loving cat. Feral cats don't end up being like he is. He was probably dumped out there. He's got frostbite on his feet. He's got pads that are like cracked leather, and his tail is dead from here on down. Oh, baby. Are we okay. going to take it off? Oh, uh, yes. So, I guess I want to talk a little bit about that and about how important this all is during the winter. Um, so, um, well, basically, this is this guy when he came in had severe neurological problems. He couldn't stand up. He could not walk. He could not. He was dragging himself. Um, this is from being out in the cold. This isn't any other element than what the cold weather did to him. And as the days have gone on, he has. Yeah, I as the days have gone on, he has become more steady on his feet, probably because of nutrition, but also that he's finally had a chance to, for his body to kind of get back to a normal te temperature and everything. And I guess what I'm saying is he wouldn't have survived out there very much longer. Um, and I think about the animals out there tonight and tomorrow and tomorrow night. We've posted a lot of stuff on our Facebook page. We've tried to get the word out there. 
um, you know, we've been watching certain, you know, places that we're concerned. But I don't think some people realize sometimes what, when the cold's affecting you, it's affecting them. And just because they have a fur coat on means nothing. It's like you wearing a, it's like me wearing this and walking outside in below zero weather. It's going to keep me warmer than if I didn't have it, but it's not going to sustain me in very, very cold weather. So um, I kind of wanted to just go over some things to have on record. Um, and that goes under animals in the snow, cold wind. Um, when it comes down to this, is if you're cold, when you're putting your dog out, they're cold, okay? I'm very thirsty. Um, short haired animals are even more susceptible to the cold. So, you know, dogs like Labs, Labradors, Beachless, any short haired dog is going to feel even more. And so there's guidelines that we like people to follow. One is uh, pet cats should not be left outside. Um, even if they are the rest of the year. This is no time for, they've been fine this long, they're gonna make it. This is time to be proactive and get these animals inside. There's, you know, there's there's no other way I can put it. If you normally have an outside dog that is an outside dog, I have people say to me, well, I have a husky and he really likes the cold. Okay, but the husky doesn't even like 40 or 50 below. So if he's normally an outdoor dog, or even tonight, if you don't have a good place, put him in your basement. But don't leave them out. Don't leave cats to wonder, say, well, you know, cats can fit into anywhere and find a place to be. This guy didn't, you know, and that's very concerning to me. Um, so when it comes to dogs, if they absolutely must be outdoors, it has to be a dog house preferably built off the ground a couple inches so they're not laying directly on the cold ground. It has to be stacked and stuffed with straw preferably. Blankets get wet, they freeze up, they become hard, and they do no good. Straw is, you know, they can regenerate the, the heat within the straw. So straw, and I'd stuff it full so they have something to burrow into. Um, and don't use wood chips because wood chips, you know, flatten out and really and they can't they can't get down into them to get the warmth they need. Um, if you're letting your dogs outside go potty, at the very maximum, five to seven minutes. I mean, I know from personal experience now, my dogs, literally, I've never seen dogs that can move so fast to go potty now that can't move that fast. <laughs> so, um, they, they know it's cold, they don't want to be inside. Um, Rufus has got his dog door down to a 30 second deal. He's out yeah. for 30 seconds and he's back in. Do you have any other kind of tips before we move on to the report? 
Um, well, yeah, just one other, a couple other things here. Um, watch their ears, the pads of their feet. Um, they get frostbitten just like we do. This kitty is proof of that. And, you know, be careful how you use the heat lamps, but if you have them, do, do use them. The animals will, will appreciate it and they'll be, they'll come out better in the end if, if you do that. Um, blanket your horses. If you have horses, blanket them, put the blanket on them. Um, have them frozen water for your livestock. You know, you, most people have automatic water, just make sure the float is working. Um, if you have smaller ones, buckets, make sure that they're working. And I guess the most important thing is if anybody sees an animal in distress, don't say, well, I thought somebody else would call about it, or I thought my neighbor would turn it in. Let us know. We, that's what we're here for, that's what our job is. And we, you know, we're, we're so concerned about what's gonna happen the next day and a half, two days. And so there's things that, that can happen that humans can do to make sure that, you know, the animals get through this. Thank you, I think they're good tips given that we're closing that uh, to remind people to take care of all men, all living creatures. So, okay, so let's I can kind of rank this, wrap this up here so okay. a little bit quicker. So we have currently 162 animals in the shelter, 149 cats, um, nine dogs. We have two dogs that are fostered out. One of them just had five puppies. Um, she came in big, so we didn't do anything. Four rabbits. Um, our remodeling update is coming along well. The office, the new cat adoption area are almost done. Handicap bathroom as well as handicap parking are also in place. Uh, we're still working on our mechanical and electrical. We know we now have our fobs for unlocking the doors, which is, I don't know about you guys, but it's taking me a while to get used to it because um, I'm used to carrying keys, so this yeah. is something new for me. Yeah. Um, but uh, we have a new cat visitation room, a dog visitation room. Um, we have baffles in our dog room to help with the sound, which has made a difference. You know, a barking dog, it's never going to be silent but it will at least cut down on the decibels that are ringing through their ears and ours. Um, we have our own laundry room officially. It's not in the furnace anymore. It's, we have an official laundry room. Good. It's a laundry room. And um, our outside dog play areas, they're getting used so much before this cold spell. Our volunteers love to take animals outside and play with them. And uh, we like being able to take animals who are not house trained out there and just let them kind of do their own thing and then collect them back and take them to the shelter. So the outside players for the dogs have been wonderful. Um, there's so much good progress being made. And when everything is completed, we will have an open house. That's yet to be determined. Just I think the weather right now, a lot of that is dependent on the weather. Um, but we will make sure that we advertise it well because we want everybody in Story County to come and see what, what, they, what this new shelter is. Appreciate the fact that these animals are are uh, important, and I can move on to another place that I will talk about. That I want to talk about adoption numbers rising. And so, in late office, the office, the main office in the shelter was moved into our former adoption cavern. So we have an office in there as well as the cats that were up for adoption. It was extremely close. It was extremely, you know, we didn't have a choice. We, it was kind of like going with the construction, um, and so if for a while the movement in there was was awful, really. If you had more than two people and the person that was manning that front desk in there, it was, you, you were crowded. So um, it was very frustrating at the time. And in December, well, in November, um, we kind of pretty much had an empty shelter. We only had the, the one room open that the dogs went off to be boarded for some work that was gonna be done, the mechanical stuff. And, um, so we ended up, I just kind of wanted to throw this out there, that the month of November, for instance, we only had nine total adoptions. That was not good. But a lot of people, I heard from a lot of people, they thought we were closed because of the construction. All the vehicles that were out there for a while, they said, well, you're not even open. I'm like, yeah, we are. You know, but um, so we had we did have a lot of people that didn't know, and it was just not a good way for us to represent ourselves. But we also understand that's what happens during the modeling. Um, What's happened now? That we well, so in up? December, we, we only had 13 adoptions, five of which were reptiles. So again, we were staying at that stalemate. And as of the 25th of January, we had 36. So that has like zoomed right back up. Um, we're 
moving animals into vets to make sure that they're getting spare and neutered when we get them back out, right? Um, so that has changed a lot. Um, they love the new cat adoption room. Um, we're down to coming soon to fundraiser near you. So this month, we feel grocery is doing the rounded up to the next dollar for us. Oh, nice. So at the end of the month, um, you know, we'll, we'll be the recipients of that. On Saturday, this past Saturday, January 26th, there was a fundraiser for the animal shelter at GI Jill's Food and Bar in Roland. And she's a wonderful lady. She was in the military, but she also has a heart for animals. Um, on May 18th, we will have the return of our shelter shindig with CAK. Last year, the owner had a heart attack, and they did not have it, but they're very excited about bringing it back. So we'll have petting zoos and silent auctions and everything like that. On June 15th, we have our Chase and Tails, which will be the third <laughs> fundraiser from them for us. This is a motorcycle ride, and last year, this individually raised six, over $6,000 for our shelter, which was a very big help. Um, cat vendors in the spring. So a seasoned veterinarian can do 10 cats in less than an hour when it comes to computers. They can just zip right through them if they're prepped and ready to go. So we are, we have two vets on board from different clinics that are willing to help us with that. So we're gonna probably have two days, and I think first of all, the priority will be for the people that live out in the county that have large groups of cats that, that are observing differences in population control. But we'll also be going through to our contract cities, and then it'll trickle down to when there's when there's time, if there's spaces left, then we will open it up for everyone. Good, excellent. I'm going to ask, you know, I've done this before, is please, you know, see if we can coordinate with uh, outreach to get as much publicity on that as possible. Right, and you we're know, hoping people know about it when I go We're there. hoping that maybe with two vets we can get like 125 to 150 cats done. Okay. So that would be awesome. Um, Saturday, March 2nd, we'll begin having longer hours. Okay. And so this will be what we're planning is now is on Saturday to be open from 11 to 3. Somebody will come in first thing in the morning and clean. Mm -hmm. And then the person that's cleaning and the person that's also going to work that day will stay there and man the shelter. Um, we will also be open late one night a week. It will be a Thursday, and that will begin on March 7th. Now, that being said, this is a starting point for us. This is to see what the interest is, to see what the traffic is, and to also to see how we can balance this with our employees. If it works, then we're hoping to move on to more hours on Saturday. Okay. Um, so skipping down to our great animal supporters. Oh, this is like one of my favorite parts. Um, and Sue, I do kind of want to remind you the county's closing at one today. Oh, okay, so let's just so the case. So I think all of us have a few things to okay. do before we get out. From on. Christmas season through the middle of January, we brought in $9,836 in donations. So that's the long and the short of it. And we have many, many people to thank. But that's not always just cash. It's also, that is cash, but it's, it's also people who bring us in food and pet beds and you know, give us their time and want to do things, and I just, you know, we're very lucky we have the support that we do. Sure. Okay. And one final thing is the open house for the remodel of the shelter. I already talked about that, but I am looking for brownie, cookie, or bar makers. Okay. We would like to have some homemade goodies, so if anybody is so inclined or does a good job of baking, we would love to have you help us um, make things. We'll probably end up buying some of it, but um, we're going to try to at least have a back for the open house. That's for the open All right. house. Okay. And that will be decided when the work is done and we get everything set. Okay. So don't start bar baking just Don't bake yet. yet. All right. I know okay. I could. So right. I would say it's a credit to you and your staff, Sue, that you have the kind of support, both monetary and otherwise, that you get. It's because of the job you do and how you take care. I mean, I think the, the cat, I'm not a cat cat, but the story of that cat and, and what you've done, to, what you and your staff have done to bring it back is awesome. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Stay warm. Right. You too? I'm going to take that cat away. I want to say hi to him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, maybe an adopter. <laughs> She's got two of them already. Thanks, Kat. They're both drop offs. Yeah. Right. Let's move on. I don't know. Anybody left here who would like to provide public forum number two? I see staff only, except for Robbie. 
So, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Liaison assignments, committee meeting updates, and announcements from the supervisors. We'll start with Supervisor Merkin. Anything you'd like to tell us? I uh, everything's canceled. Okay. <laughs> Ditto. Pretty much. Supervisor Sanders. Yes, Story College was canceled this morning, so that was supposed to be our first formal meeting. Uh, we rescheduled for Friday morning at 7 a.m., so I'll do that before I leave town. Okay. And um, I'm just, I also look at lots of cancellations here. We contacted. Uh, let you know that uh, the um, compensation board met last night and they went with a 10% increase in the sheriff's salary and 3% increase for all of the other elected officials. So with that, plus, plus $1,000 to the board chair, which is we had not been doing for a few well, years right. ago. Oh, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. It came out in the minutes that the thousand dollars extra for the board chair. It was not said. It was not. Well, they not had to have made. So let's get. Let's make sure we get those minutes cleaned up. <gasps> that's out. what Stacy was. Oh, sorry. That's what uh, 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 recorder Harridge was talking about. We didn't figure. We couldn't tell what she was saying. We will get that fixed. Yeah. Up oh, well, that yeah. Was, yeah. So that was something that the board instituted, or that right. the county instituted in like two thousand four or five. And it continued through, I believe, 2015 or so. At that point, I was board chair, and I just said, no, it's not that. I mean, it, part of the deal. Right. I was selected, right. and it's just part of the deal. Right. So I was surprised when I when it I saw was, it. It was that she was I don't, surprised. I don't recall that, so we'll have to check into it. Yep. I know exactly when it happened, but the whole sentence was never said. Stacy, uh, recorder Harry said from the back of the room, plus for the board of supervisors and it didn't say any doubt didn't say anything else and i thought it was for us to talking about bringing something forward so no that didn't happen and okay. i'll call steve mcgill who took the notes the minutes right away all right upon that then i think i'd move the adjourn. right thank you okay look it was the hammer and everything all right so everybody um stay